VHS Cole. VHS Cole. This is VHS Cole. We're here to make you get sad about stuff. Make you feel things about movies. I'm Kyle. This is my muscle. I'm Sean. This is my mustache. You can't see it though. Yeah, because <laughs> this is a this is a auditory medium. Yeah, since this is an audio experience, you can't tell by flexing my bicep. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? Can you hear me? Uh, I'm gonna ruffle uh, uh, my beard hair. Uh, the uh, last episode when I was editing it, um, there was part of the sound mix where I, you could hear me scratching my beard. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's, so that's pretty good. The important stuff. Happy, Happy New Year! Year. Yeah, <laughs> 2020. This is it. We've been waiting for it. Barbara, so this is the new year. Barbara Walters has been waiting for it. <laughs> it's in 2020. 2020. I've decided I'm going to war on 2020. I'm talking. The uh, news or the year? The year. I'm talking. I'm Can gonna, you go to war with the year? It's kind of like going to war with drugs or terrorism. And that hasn't really worked out for us. Well, I guess that I'm going to war on myself in 2020. Oh. I'm talking about. Getting back into doing drugs, getting in fights, going to movies with girls and holding their hands. Those are my top three favorite things to do. <laughs> You're going to go to a real self-help revolution. Uh-huh. Man, uh, fuck that self-care shit. 2020, we're doing drugs. Sometimes self-care involves doing drugs, but usually they're prescribed by, like, a psychologist. They don't fucking know. Yeah, some of them are all right. <laughs> psychologists I'm not, I'm not, don't I'm not, know. I'm not fucking Tom Cruise over here. You're glib, Kyle. You're glib. <laughs> You're being <laughs> obtuse. Um, no, if psychologists don't know, they're oh, here you go, have some antidepressants. Yeah, right. Try heroin for the third time, Kyle. <laughs> don't don't try heroin for the third time, Kyle. No, after I'm the, here to tell you not to try heroin. After the second the time, time, I was like, can't do this one again because it is too nice. <laughs> That's the problem with heroin is uh, it's a bit moorish. Uh, speaking of the end of the year, did you end up watching Knives Out? Knives Out. No, I haven't watched it yet. Oh, what a loser. Right. Did you watch Parasite? No, it's uh, I have a bunch of shit that I'm gonna, I'm supposed to watch that I have not watched yet. Did you watch Uncut Gems? No. Oh Jesus, you're missing out on everything. I watched a lot of Christmas movies. I've read a lot of books. So I, I read uh, The Long Goodbye, which is the Raymond Chandler book that I've been holding on to for a long time, and I, I didn't. Uh, it was for a special occasion, and then finally I just said fuck it and I read it. None of this is primo content for Twitter. I sorry. <laughs> I know Twitter cares about Parasite and like Rise of the Skywalkers. Rise of the I'll probably Skywalker. Rise of the Skywalkers because the kids want to see it, but we've been dragging our feet. I've been really hoping like a DVD screener would would pop up online. Telling you, there shouldn't be screeners for Star Wars. It's not eligible for the 2019 award season. Well, you know, I'm telling you that they they're out there. Yeah, for the Nerd Fart Awards. Here you go, Kurt Busiek. Busiek. Oh, I'd say that's the. Uh, we we talked about comic book writers that we really like. He's one guy I forgot to mention. What did he write? X Men, Astro City. Oh yeah, I forgot about that comic. Also, he's done a bunch of like Marvel and DC stuff. Like, yeah, uh, Marvels. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, he's Marvel's like he's like cool. a he's an American. He's the uh, he's our answer to Grant Morrison. <laughs> Um, I don't think he's as cool or as crazy as Grant Morrison. He may not be as crazy or as cool but i think he's as good a writer as Grant morrison mm, interesting there's more to being a person than being cool not that i've seen <laughs> it's pretty much all i care about what if, what are your plans for 2020 uh don't die don't die keep it pushing keep on keep it on you know what i mean Keep it pushing. Don't be scared. No, I'm going to be scared and anxious and paranoid a lot of 2020 because that's really the last 35 years of my life. Not me. I'm giving up on it. What, anxiety? Mm hmm. <laughs> no, you're not. It's not no, that's no. always there. Rearing its ugly head. Just no. Right around the corner. I'm just going to choose not to. <laughs> I saw people are just like, oh, change your diet, exercise, and all that sort of stuff. I fucking I exercise. Well, I haven't been pretty bad about it the last couple of weeks, but I exercise pretty basically every day, and I eat pretty well. Like I, I drink almost nothing but water, and I still have anxiety and paranoia. So you know, fuck you and your diet and exercise. I was gonna bring up the same thing. Like, yep, I work out like five times a week. Diet's pretty good. Pretty much only drink water and tea. Lots of anxiety. What's the problem? And I'm telling you. It's because I'm not doing enough drugs. <laughs> Except for when I was. Well, you know, it's got to be the right drugs, too. 
when I was like a wreck in my twenties, doing lots of drugs and drinking all I feel the time, like you were worse. I was full of a lot of anxiety. <laughs> it seemed to exacerbate the situation where I'd get fucked up, feel pretty good, then I'd regret it in the morning, and because of the regret, the depression, and anxiety set in, be like, well, I guess I'll get fucked up again so I can forget about it. But then it rears. A lot of those drugs have some like you know, you know come down effects that aren't so great. You just gotta make sure you got the right cocktail going. <laughs> I've read uh, Leaving or uh, Leaving Vegas. What the fuck is that? Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. You. Leaving Vegas is that fucking Nick Cage movie, isn't it? Yeah. Whatever. Leaving Las Vegas. Yeah, no, definitely. I think like my entire 25th year was uh, just one long come down. Just trying to, like, try, got to get the right mix in there. Come on. Come on. Where's the happiness at? I, no serotonin. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely zero serotonin. <laughs> like, well, you know what? Let's roll again. That'll help. Push out that serotonin. <laughs> <laughs> Barren landscape, no serotonin. We watched a movie, oh, Barren Landscape with no serotonin. Sure did. We watched The Road Warrior. That wasn't part of the deal. <laughs> what a rush! You know, if you break a deal, you know what you gotta do? Not in this one. Oh, you gotta I don't think anybody broke a deal, so maybe they would face the wheel if, if they broke a deal. You gotta face the wheel if you break a deal. Yeah, the year 2020 is looking a little bit like Mad Max. I was uh, watching this film. It's uh, This is uh, one of my top ten films of all time. I really love The Road Warrior. I love The, Road I love the entire Mad Max like uh, uh, universe or whatever. And um, I was watching The Road Warrior and I said, you know what? This is better than every Star Wars movie combined. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's just on the internet talking about, oh, you know, the prequels are this, the original trip, blah, blah, blah. Nah. I mean, I don't I don't want to hear from, like, I, I have my own problems with Star Wars, but I don't want to hear anybody talk about how great the prequel trilogy is at all. No, I want to learn about space politics. Read Dune. Dune just copied Star Wars or the other way around? The other way around. Whatever. They're a garbage. I don't care about Dune. <laughs> Sandworms. Dune is fucking not. Uh, yeah, I don't like Dune either. <laughs> I guess I'll probably care about it when the movie comes out. Because you like Dennis Flong <laughs> You don't know how to say his name. I like him terrible with names. How many times <laughs> do you... How, <laughs> his name is Have Denis, you met me? <laughs> Denis Villeneuve. He's a uh, Quebecois, obviously. There's a reason I give everybody I know nicknames. Nicknames. Hey, champ. What's up, bud? <laughs> Better than that. <laughs> I hate it when people call me bud. I don't know why. Just... I hate to, uh, when uh, when ladies that I don't know call me honey. Oh, I don't mind. That bothers me. I don't give a fuck. Who cares? I don't care about that shit. It's just people being nice. It's fine when people are nice. Are they being nice or are they belittling you, Kyle? You never know. Mm, huh? I don't think so. <laughs> Yeah, so we watched The Road Warrior here on the VHS Cult. VHS Cult. This is what it has come to. Look! Elsa! They're coming back! Come on! Move it! Here is where it shall be decided. There it is. Greetings from the Humongous. In a world without gas. The Humongous rules! I'm gravely disappointed that you wish to take the gasoline out of the wasteland. Defend the fuel. We'll never walk away! Give me the pump, the gasoline, the whole compound. This is a land that prays for a hero. Well, if anyone's gonna get in there, it's gonna be you. Uh, this is Mad Max 2. Hopefully you watched it too, to be prepared. Me or the people I'm listening? Everyone. Entire planet Earth. 2020, you know... I've been listening to some other podcasts, just random one-offs to see like what the competition's like. There is no competition. Everyone sounds terrible. So 2020, let's get this shit. As the kids said months ago, probably a year ago at this point, let's get this bread. 
<laughs> Let's obtain this grain. This is the year of VHS cult 2020. I'm calling it. We're getting like get that Chapo Trap House money. <laughs> I would take half of the Chapo Trap House money. Fucking, I'd take a fucking man, quarter of that. I'd shit. like to make like a thousand dollars a month. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted the equivalent of Yang Bucks. I was just reading about a anesthesiologist who makes one point three million dollars a year, and uh, her uh, her her spending around money is seventy three thousand dollars a month. That's pretty good. That's 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 all I need for a year. More than I need. I got, I got I got three kids, Kyle. That's like impossible numbers. I've never seen numbers like that. Seventy three thousand. Oh Jesus. I think uh, I think I made that one year at Vanguard when I was working like six days a week, sixty hours a week. Six days a week. I love Vanguard. <laughs> That's what you were saying, huh? Thanks for the cashola. Uh, speaking of Chapo Trap House and weird ass like white boy hipsters that move to Brooklyn and then act like they're so New York, I've noticed that those types of people are really the ones that are championing uncut gems. It makes me really reluctant to say that Uncut Gems is one of the best films of the year. Because <laughs> a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, it's so New York. And because it makes them feel cool that they're like real estate adjacent to actual New Yorkers. <laughs> Just uh, do what I do and pay very little attention to anybody's opinions about stuff online. Unless it's like so pervasive that I can't get away from it, like Star Wars. Then I have no idea what anybody's saying about any movie. Oh, I'm mining people's opinions for content for the podcast. Why would you do that? <laughs> things to complain about. So things to um to position others against me to prove uh, my value. Oh, okay. So what, what Twitter's for. Exactly. It's a competition. The great competition. We're all crabs in a bucket. Fuck it. 2020, this is the year. The big year. The cult's getting going. Fuck Jared Leto and his cult. His VHS cult. <laughs> well, I was also reading that apparently the Flaming Lips have a cult. That sounds fun. <laughs> I remember when they were touring with Miley Cyrus and they'd come out of a giant vagina. And I was like, damn, that's what's up. I like vaginal art. Yeah. Interesting I don't stuff. dislike vaginal art. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, it could be interesting. Mm-hmm. Just like any art. That's true. That's true. You're right. All right. Road Warrior, speaking of art, this is directed by George Miller. Every, everyone kind of knows George Miller, right? You because know. of Fury Road at this point. Well, yeah, but because of Fury Road, everyone knows he did the Mad Max uh, quadrilogy. At one time, the time specifically when Fury Road was coming out, there was a lot of jokes about, oh, yeah, he directed Babe, in, Babe Pig in the City. Now, Babe is a good movie. And Happy Feet 1 and 2. I mean, the, the the joke was the juxtaposition of these children's movies with um, very uh, action-oriented Fury Road. Yeah, that's because he's talented, Kyle. Yes, but here's the thing. <laughs> People also seem to forget that this man directed The Witches of Eastwick lorenzo's oil and the best segment in the twilight zone movie also feels like we can't escape the twilight zone movie it just keeps <laughs> coming up. Coming <laughs> <laughs> i bet a lot of people feel like they never escaped the twilight zone movie some people didn't escape <laughs> it. uh yeah he did the what is it Twenty Thousand or nightmare at Twenty Thousand feet which is oh there's a bear on the wing <laughs> made famous the by william shatner before star trek right yeah but uh, yeah, no, his his segment's the best. He was uh, handpicked by Steven Spielberg because of Road Warrior. Wow, Road Warrior. Mad Max, Mad Max Two, the Road Warrior. In the United States, it's called the Road Warrior because uh, no one really saw Mad Max, but everywhere else, it's Mad Max Two, especially Australia. This movie will later go on to be a Stranger Things reference. Oh, really? They reference this movie? Yeah, the little redhead girl is is Mad Max. Oh. Max is Mad Max. Mm -hmm. Stranger Things sucks. <laughs> uh, currently, George Miller, is, George Miller is working on a film called 3,000 Years of Longing. Or is that Secret Mad Max? Uh, apparently, there's another one that's been announced, but we'll see if that happens. Yeah, they've been talking about that one since Fury Road. Yeah, 3,000 Years of Longing is in pre-production. Uh, no one really knows what it's about, but it's some sort of love story, and it will be starring Idris Elba and Tilda Swinton. That's right. DJ Big Driz. That's not Tilda Swinton's DJ name. It is Idris Elvis. Oh. He doesn't seem that big. Bigger than <clears throat> Donnie Wahlberg. Oh, yeah. He had... Um, <laughs> What's in shoes? He had platform Chuck Taylors. Them shits was weird. Bigger than Mel Gibson. Although, I guess Bruce Spence is a fucking giant. Yeah, I think Mel Gibson's only like 5'9", though. 
which is like average height, but you know, it's not it's not what I think of when I think of a man. I think, <laughs> I think of Idris Elba. <laughs> I was watching this though, and I was, uh, this Mad Max and Fury Road, or not Fury Road, Road, Road Warrior, Warrior no, uh, Fury Road. specifically, I was looking at Mel Gibson and I was like, he looks like he could be our uncle or something. <laughs> <laughs> Despite only being 5'9", when our family is historically over six feet. Here's a very special quote from George Miller. He says, The way I think of filmmaking, such a seductive thing. It encompasses every human discipline you can imagine. Composition, art, technology, music, movement, and choreography. It encompasses all life. We are the servants of the zeitgeist and we live in a chaotic world. There is so much information coming at you. We are trying to find resonance out there to create some kind of meaning. Stories are a way of distilling something out of all that bombardment. They are a way of finding signal in the noise. That's very seductive. Very seductive. seductive. I do remember a Quentin Tarantino, well, paraphrasing a Quentin Tarantino quote about Road Warrior. And it's like, George Miller has a way of of shooting these cars that makes you want to masturbate to them. Which is accurate. That's on brand for Quentin Tarantino, too. (laughs) I mean, he didn't mention feet, so. That's like uh, Ain't It Cool News Guys type of uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) film criticism. (laughs) (laughs) This film made me want to jerk off. (laughs) Yeah, so George Miller's pretty cool. I like that quote a lot. Um, It kind of encapsulates what I like about movies so much. But let's move on. Let's talk about Mel Gibson. What do you know about Mel Gibson? If you want to know some thoughts about Mel Gibson, you can go back and listen to our Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome episode or... uh, I, uh, I enjoy him when I see him in a movie, mm-hmm. but as, as a person, he's, he's uh, a crazy person. He's right? a crazy person. He's a crazy person. Well, check it out. He was named after the church of St. Mel in Clonmel County, Tipperary, Ireland, where his mother's family is from. You'll find this very interesting. At least I, f- I found it quite interesting. I think you might as well. Anyone who's out there who's interested in that language or linguistics might find it interesting. So uh, Clonmel, it's in Tipperary. Clonmel is the anglicized version of Clun Mala. Which uh, means honey meadow in Irish. Check it out. Check it out. Mel also means honey in Portuguese. Why would the Irish language share words with the Portuguese language? Jesuits. Some sort of Iberian Peninsula people. Why would that happen? (laughs) Are you waiting for like a historical linguist to show up? Oh, no. It's just going to pop it in and tell us. It's just because of uh, ethnic and cultural, cultural relations, right? So it's just one of the things that kind of points to the fact that the insular Celts, the British Isle Celts, are related to the Celtic peoples of like the Iberian Peninsula. Yeah. You're, so there you you're, go. You're classic Gauls. Yeah. Or there's a difference between Gauls and Celts, but maybe not. You know? Yeah, well, it's hard. It's been a few thousand years. We don't really yeah. know. It also led me down a rabbit hole where I was learning all the um, Irish pronunciations of like all the counties and capitals in the counties in Ireland. So, <laughs> so that was fun. Another interesting fact about good old Honey Gibson is that due to the worldwide recession in 2008, his personal fortune is reported to have declined from around $900 million to $650 million. The poor bastard. Wait, Mel Gibson was worth almost a billion dollars? Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> Mel Gibson is like the fucking filthiest, richest like movie guy of all time. Great. I mean, I knew he had to be worth like uh, probably like $100 million, right? Let's see. But I know he made like Passion of the Christ and all that shit. I can't imagine. I just how did he get that much money? Braveheart. That he didn't make that much money. It did. It made crazy. It like made three hundred million, right? Gangbusters at the time. Oh, he's got to have like other like. Well, he's yeah, like, he's got a production company that makes a lot of shit. He's got to have tons of other investments and stuff. So what I'm talking about. I just need. I just need a little 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 taste of that. I just need a little scratch to get me going. A little scratch. You know, you understand. Maybe I don't want the Mel Gibson, you know, blood sugar tits money, but I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe I do. I don't know. I mean, if money shit. He's uh, he's kind of crazy the same way I'm crazy. So I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I've never heard. You've been drunk lots of times. I've never heard you go on a rant against Jewish yeah. people. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like I said last time we talked about, it, it was like I kind of get it, but then it's also like, even at my worst, I've never like said racist shit. <laughs> um, he is though. Possibly the problem he has, well, I mean, basically his father's fucking nuts. And he was raised a set of vacantist Catholic. Tradcast on Twitter. Here's a new uh, Catholic trend you can jump on. It's not new, but go for it. Yeah, but they're just rediscovering old shit. 
Uh, basically, uh, post-Vatican the second popes have forfeited their position through their acceptance of her- heretical teachings connected with the second Vatican Council, and consequently, there is at present no known true pope. <laughs> basically, these are Catholics who don't really recognize the church because of some bullshit that happened in medieval times. I mean, you can pick any random point. There's a lot of shit that happened to the church in medieval times. Yeah, I I was also reading about all the different sects of Catholicism that exist that are based around With weird this little shit. Council versus that one. Yeah, and it's like, man, fucking Catholicism is dumb. Well, I mean, how many popes technically are there right now? Two, right? There's the Eastern Eastern Orthodox Pope. I don't know. It's all dumb. The only good thing about it is it's better than being Protestant because at least you can drink alcohol. <laughs> Uh, this film also stars Bruce Spence, who we talked about before. He's a long guy. He's very long. Long. He's the mouth of Sauron. Yeah. He's uh, <laughs> he's actually from New Zealand, though. You dummy. You thought he was Australian? He's a Kiwi. Ah, oh, shit. He was in Lord, of the, Rings. He's in Lord <laughs> of the Rings. He was in Lord of the Rings, so he must have been from New Zealand. <laughs> According to George Miller, to give you an idea of the setting of this film, it goes thusly. All of the catastrophic events we read we read about in the news, economic collapse, power grids breaking down, wholesale climate change, some nuclear skirmish on the other side of the globe, as of next Wednesday, all of those things will have happened. Then we jump 45 years into the future. There we have a world that has regressed back to almost medieval behavior. <laughs> Only the artifacts of the present world survive. For instance, the kind of vehicles we have now, which rely so much on computers, really wouldn't survive in a post-apocalyptic world. But the hot rods and muscle cars... Not only survive, they become almost fetishized like religious artifacts. Badass. You see that the most inferior road does when he's most Bad. really. I think it's because that's the one with the most budget. You know what I mean? Like you kind of see it progressively. Like the first Mad Max, you have a little bit of that touch. Like it's, the world is still kind of in place a little bit in the first Mad Max too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, 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 each series he goes a little bit further, or each. Entry goes a little. Well, bit it's, further. it kind of goes like this. He makes Mad Max. Um, he stays frustrated about it for the next three or four years because it wasn't as good as he wanted it to be. So he makes The Road Warrior, and he's like, hell yeah, I did it. Done with Mad Max. Um, Then he comes up with another idea about a post-apocalyptic world where an adult finds like a tribe of like children that are surviving, and someone goes, hey, what if the adult was Mad Max? And he's like, okay. And he makes Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, and it's... uh, his first foray into commercial filmmaking, and it's pretty goofy. And then, uh, I don't know, the years go by, and he's like, you know what? I could, like, really do The Road Warrior now. And so he makes Fury Road, which is basically, like, the final draft of Mad Max. I mean, so, Fury Road really is, like, George Lucas going back and specializing or, you know, punching up Star Wars a little bit. I mean, does it, it's different, you know what I mean? But it, Fury Road is kind of just The Road Warrior. Well, that's the whole thing about the Mad Max cinema universe, really, is it, it's all not vague because um, you can see. I mean, all the pieces are there. You, you think it's that that goes back to the Hemingway thing. Like, you don't necessarily have to say what it is, but you have to know what's going on. Yeah. So, but um, Mad Max being sort of like a folk hero of sorts means you can really just tell any story you want about him. And so, Fury Road is kind of similar to Road Warrior. It's basically the final draft of Road Warrior. But it's also like its own story just because here's some other people that ran into Mad Max and this is what happened. Yeah. And that's why it's better than Star Wars because it leans heavily into it being like a fable. And Star Wars is like, yeah, but what if everything was uh, codified? We need to explain <laughs> how, did it. how Jedis work. Jedis were already like kind of a dumb idea. <laughs> and then let's make it worse. <laughs> Uh, James Cameron said um, this is his biggest influence to make Terminator was Road Warrior, hmm. which makes sense. And Road Warrior itself, heavily influenced by the classic Western film, Shane. 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 Which, like, uh, the most obvious thing is um, Mad Max becoming friends with the feral kid, just like in Shane when he becomes friends with that dumb kid. <laughs> I don't actually like Shane that much, but, you know, <laughs> I'm sure it was great at the time. Yeah, so Miller made the sequel in part two, quoting here, overcome all my frustrations on the first Mad Max because that was such a low budget and such a tough movie that I had all this sort of pent up energy for the story and the filmmaking. So he's like, you know what? Let's do it again. That wasn't part of the deal. 
Remember when uh, Fury Road came out and dweebs were like, Tom Hardy doesn't even talk. This isn't like Mad Max. This is fucking dumb. Tom Hardy's <laughs> not even main character. <laughs> Mad Max has like five lines in this movie. Mel Gibson only had 16 lines of dialogue in the entire film, and two of them were, all, were I only came for the gasoline. I only came for the gasoline. I only came for gasoline. I only came for the gasoline. You want to get out of here? You talk to me. <laughs> so sometimes it sounds like they say guzzoline. Is that just the accent? Or yeah, the accent. Like, guzzoline. I only came for the guzzoline. Why don't they call it petrol? Only another petrol. <laughs> I only <laughs> came for the petrol. <laughs> So, uh, a lot of the fucking people complaining about Fury Road or Fury Road are wrong about that. Let, as we continue onward, let's see what other things they were wrong about. <laughs> it's almost as if they didn't uh, actually watch any of the Mad Max movies. Not like us who basically watch Road Warrior every other weekend. Yeah, we did watch it a lot. I was like, man, this is probably the 200th time I've seen this movie, <laughs> maybe more. I was watching it with the court, and she's like, oh, I like that dog. I'm like, don't. This movie was shot in sequence. Isn't that crazy? Oh, man, that never happens. Not especially an action movie. That um, wasn't part of the deal. Mm-hmm. Brian May did the soundtrack for uh, Mad Max. I have to talk to you about this offline, but it's too it's too much. It's it's like watching fucking Looney Tunes. It's too on the nose. It's, everything about this movie is perfect. So. No, this, the soundtrack is a little all over the top. Yeah, I don't particularly care about Brian May or Queen. Sorry, the internet. I think it's perfectly... It fits well, Robbie Malik, he's an amazing singer. He's just, just as good a job as Freddie, Carl. He didn't sing. What?! <laughs> He just put on big teeth, and he's like, ah, oh, darling, I'm Freddie Mercury with big teeth. Get it? Give him awards. He looks like Freddie Mercury. That's acting for you. Fucking Remy Malik. That son of a bitch. The opening credits and narrated prologue are in mono, and then the Dolby stereo sound kicks in on the whoosh sound whoosh. as the film fast-forwards to the present. The uh, There's some scenes from the first Mad Max in that narration, right? Yeah, and also that was created for the United, the American audience because um, no one saw Mad Max. <laughs> I did. Yeah, in Australia, they don't have that part. For several of the car crash scenes, the crew placed remote-controlled cameras in reinforced metal housings. They nicknamed them Ned Kelly's. <laughs> That's pretty good, huh? That's a good Australian. joke. <laughs> for those, uh, it's a super Australian joke. Yeah, for those listening that don't know about Ned Kelly... Uh, he's a bushman, a bush ranger, but basically it just means he was like a cowboy criminal in the Australian outback. Uh, but one time when his house was being raided, him and his brothers fashioned like homemade armor yeah. to go confront um, the dudes that were after him. Uh, Heath Ledger and Orlando Bloom made a movie about him. Oh yeah, they did. I think it's just called Ned Kelly, right? I think it is. Hmm. There's also like an old ass Ned Kelly. Australia is a good place for westerns. There's been a lot of good ones. Quickly down under. Quickly down under. I was thinking more like um, the proposition and stuff. <laughs> you know, you know. The uh, woman that wrote and directed Babadook had a Australian Western that came out this year called Nightingale, which is pretty good. So Bruce Spence, he plays the uh, gyro captain. Yep. He was uh, written and created for the movie specifically just so that they could get helicopter shots in the movie. Smart. Yep. So, so getting the helicopter and doing aerial shots is really expensive. And he's like, we need to write a reason into it so that we can have a helicopter. <laughs> so, Mad Max. He's got a cool outfit on. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. He looks like a real tough, cool guy. Basically, he inspired the entire Fallout series just by looking like a tough, cool guy. I mean, the Mad Max kind of inspired the entire Fallout series, yeah. Like, hey, well, let's put a dog in it because Mad Max had a dog. That's more Bethesda, though. But we all know Bethesda doesn't have any of their own ideas. <laughs> but there's uh, specific reasons for why Mad Max looks as cool as he does. Would you like to know those reasons? No. All right, moving on. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, so the right arm of his jacket's missing. That's because his uh, arm's run over by a motorbike in the first Mad Max. And medics would have had to cut the sleeve off rather than pull it over a damaged limb. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's got a squeaky leg brace. That's because he got shot in the knee in the first Mad Max. Yeah. Uh, he's got the harness with spanners and other objects dangling off of it. And that's obviously just to repair his car and shit. And then the first two fingers of each of his driving gloves are missing. And that's so he can much easier load his shotgun. What a smart it's a good character reasons, huh? Yeah, so I bring that up because of what we were talking about previously. Like... Uh, you brought up yeah. where it's a uh, show don't tell which is the kind of the essence of filmmaking it's interesting a lot of filmmakers don't uh, utilize the, the the visual medium anymore and <laughs> everything is just in really bad dialogue star wars yeah you basically can see everything you need to know about 
Mad Max. Like even if you hadn't seen the first one and don't know the specific reasons for his costuming being the way it is, you look at him and you're like, all right, this guy's seen some shit. He's uh, you know, a bit of a, a bit of a samurai cowboy out there doing his shit. That's kind of like how all the Mad Max films work. And we'll talk about it more when we get to Lord Humongous's gang. <laughs> you mean the gang that inspired a million wrestling gimmicks? <laughs> <laughs> you remember when we did the Survivor Series episode, you were talking about how Hogan said everyone was trying to copy um Muhammad Ali yeah. for their promos? I disagree. I think everyone was trying to copy Lord Humongous. <laughs> Because the part, uh, not his first speech where he's got the megaphone, but later on when they um, burn the guys that they captured and oh, he's yeah, on the yeah. hill and he's like flexing like crazy and yelling. That's like every promo from the 80s. Yeah. You know, <gasps> we also, we gotta think, you also have to think like Hogan is talking about his perspective coming up like the late 70s. So maybe like when his time people were kind of like even Macho Man kind of has that same like Muhammad Ali kind of cadence or. But you're right. A lot of those guys do have like, oh, I'm here to kill you. Uh, we go. Beat you up. Uh, run go live your lives <laughs> <laughs> yeah Lord Humongous is pretty cool though he's played by um, he's way better than uh, what the fuck is it? Morton Joe and Morton Joe no yeah. Morton Joe's good no Lord Humongous is better than Morton Joe mm, I don't know I like have a hard time reconciling so basically what happens is when I watch Fury Road I'm like alright this is this is Mad Max. This is better than Road Warrior. And then you watch. Road and then Road I watch Road Warrior. I'm like, no, this is this is better than Fury Road. <laughs> so I I, I'll tell you right now, Fury Road doesn't have a driver captain in it. I don't need him. <laughs> I need the driver captain. You got Charlie Theron and then all of um, Morton Joe's wives. Um, the dog. You like the dog? Everyone loves the, the dog. doggy. Loves a good dog. Uh, his name is Simply Dog. He was obtained from a local dog pound and tra- trained to perform in the film. And uh, check this out. Because of the, the engines, they, they, they upset him. He doesn't like the sound of the engines. In fact, he uh, uh, he even pissed all over the interceptor at one point. <laughs> he had uh, special earplugs. Oh, Yeah, special doggy earplugs. And then after filming was complete, he was uh, adopted by one of the camera operators. Oh, good for him. And I have a note here that says, uh, Fallout stole everything from this movie. <laughs> they didn't steal cars. That's no. the only thing they're still working on. How, are they ever going to incorporate cars in that fucking game? I don't fucking know. Jesus Christ. What are you waiting on, you dummies? Fallout 5. Total garbage. They That's uh, that's the open world like MMO game that needs to come out next is the uh, Mad Max. Mad Max. Yeah. The Wasteland. The Conan arc game. Yeah, less crafting bullshit though. I don't care about that shit. Nah, you, gotta be, you gotta go to the bullet farm and craft your bullets. <laughs> no, no thanks. <laughs> I think I will just be a warlord. Has anyone ever? I mean, I know like the the only one for sure that takes place first is Mad Max, right? And after that, yeah. they can take place in any order. But has anyone ever actually tried to sit down and figure out what order these stories supposedly take place? So in? we know for sure from George Miller that there's the first Mad Max. Five years later is the Road Warrior, and then everything after that, I don't know. Hmm. It's whenever. I always like when I was watching Free Road, I was pretty certain like the uh, the Max was actually supposed to be the feral kid. Oh, yeah, that was getting passed around the internet, but uh, George Miller specifically said, nope, and then they did the comic series for Fury Road that George Miller co-wrote, and it's, nah, it's not the feral kid. That'd also be dumb as shit. I don't care about the feral kid. I don't know why people love feral kids so much. I don't know that I necessarily that I love the feral kid. It's just that I thought it would make sense. But he's got Max's jacket. Yeah, I just assumed he was trying to copy Max because the bro- Interceptor and Max's jacket are destroyed in the Road Warrior. Mm-hmm. So that you would have Fury Road would have to take place before the the Road Warrior, right? But then the Interceptor and the jacket are destroyed in Fury Road too, aren't they? It's been a while since I've seen Fury Road. Yeah, I don't. Well, yeah. Fury, Plus, uh, I'm pretty sure that at one point doesn't he, Max have the goddamn uh, music box that he gives the Feral Kid in this movie? What in Fury Road? Yeah. I know there's a music box in Fury Road. Again, I have to go back and watch it. I'll probably watch it at some point in a couple weeks. Yeah, I was thinking about double featuring it last night, but then um, I was like, nah, I'm watching Uncut Gems again. <laughs> I fucking really like that movie. The Safety Brothers are great. I actually don't know if I like it more than Good Time, but it is a really good movie. They have a very interesting style. You're just into Sam, right? Like, I don't know. Oh, the Sandman. The Sandman. The Sandman. I, um, he's great in it. Uh, I don't particularly care about him too much though, but you know, he's great in the movie. And look, it's Lakeith Stanfield like steals the show. How is he not always the main character in every movie? 
I was watching Knives Out, and I was like, uh, get fucking James Bond out of here. Make Lakeith Stanfield <laughs> be detective. And then I was watching Uncut Gems, and I was like, get Sandman out of here. Have Lakeith do it. <laughs> Um, speaking of the dog, though, he was actually quite fond of Bruce Spence. So, like, the scenes where the dog had to act aggressive or attack the gyro captain, he had to, like, play with him beforehand and, like, rile him up and, like, encourage him to bite the scarf that he's wearing. And then they just kind of edited it around it, dubbed over some growling. And so him playing with the dog, like, made it seem like he was actually attacking (laughs) him. That's movie magic, folks. When you're watching the film and you know it's Australia... Uh, it's uh, Mungi Mungi, and you're watching it. You're like, yeah, this is Australia. It's a desert. Thinking uh, it was probably pretty hot there, huh? I guess it depends on when they filmed it, right? Well, if Australia you, has a winter. If you're it's thinking, not right now, but they have one. If you were thinking it was hot, you were wrong. It was actually extremely cold. <laughs> I feel bad for Lord Humongous then. Well, Gibson, <laughs> no wonder his nipples are so hot. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's so angry. <laughs> it's fucking cold out here. Uh, Mel Gibson would spend his time in between takes huddled under blankets, despite being dressed in a leather outfit. Cuddling with a dog. Yeah, and while the Marauders suffered in particular with their costumes, which oh, deliberately shit. exposed their buttocks. <laughs> well, the one guy had like an ass flap. <laughs> Wes? Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of that, that brings us into our next little factoid. Mr. Uh, Vernon Wells, who plays Wes, kind of like the main antagonist, even though Lord Humongous is his boss. We'll talk about that more, though, because I have a theory about something going on there. <laughs> uh, Mel Gibson called Vernon Wells barometer bum because the outfit he was wearing for the role of Wes, when Wells' butt cheeks went purple on set, they'd send everyone into the bus so they could warm up. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> they knew everyone was cold when his butt cheeks were real cold. Check out his ass. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, man. They seemed like they're having a good time on this set where um, tons of people were getting hurt in stunts. There's actually only like two major accidents. Um, the warrior woman in the film was also designed to be attractive to Max in a specific way. Uh, Byron Kennedy, who is the co-writer and producer, had especially put emphasis on her large scar across her cheek as a kind of physical paradox that would render her attractive to Max. He's quoted as saying, otherwise Max would be too shy and too ethical to get involved with her. And the romantic subplot's not really there anyway. Yeah, it's not even there. It's just kind of... They just have, like, a mutual respect for each other. Yeah. Which is absolutely Mad Max's style. People are out there like, Mad Max is the hero. Charlie Theron needs to be his wife for all some bullshit. Did someone say that for you? Well, everyone just complained that it was SJW feminist propaganda, right? As soon as the people realized that was the subtext of the film. Because I, I, mean, like, I know those people didn't catch it when they were watching it. <laughs> but then when someone brought it up as a positive, they're immediately like, what? what, what? Bullshit. <laughs> That's not what Mad Max is about. Um, also, the Golden Youth, which is uh, Wes's little buddy that rides with him. Mm-hmm. He was originally supposed to be female. But the writers decided to change the sex of the character. Much like the Warrior Woman, who was originally written as a male. To show how gender roles became interchangeable and obsolete in the Mad Max universe. But Fury Road is SJW feminism trash. <laughs> I mean, come on. Like, you have to... You just not. You just have not really seen Mad Max or if, you, if you're if you upset about the way Fury Road portrayed. Yep. I, don't, I don't fucking get it. Yeah, like, people, I'm fucking uh, beyond Thunderdome. Yeah. No, people <laughs> are just fucking dumb. Yeah, that's the big thing is they'd never watched Mad Max. They're just familiar with it as like a... A concept. Yeah, pop culture, like touchstone. And then they try to act like they're the authority on it. And so like, you're just totally wrong. Like, you just don't know anything about Mad Max, do you? You just didn't grow up having any taste. <laughs> and then he turned into this uh, little man-child asshole who complains about every, like, big tentpole franchise that has any, any even just, like, a sniff of any sort of progressive politics in it. Ah, damn. This is, oh, what a betrayal. What a betrayal. <laughs> Kyle, I don't like to be challenged in my viewpoints at all. So These men of art somehow do not have regressive ideas about women. How could this be? <laughs> could not all directors be James Cameron? <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, you know, even he's going to release Avatar, and he's going to take that crown back from Avengers Endgame. I don't think so, because... Um, he said that, though. I saw Michael Bay's latest film came out on Netflix. From yeah. Bad Boys 3? No. What is it? Six, six something? I don't know. Some bullshit action movie because Michael Bay. But I was like, 
man, if Michael Bay can't get his movies in the theaters, what's going to happen? It's legit going to be like Infinite Jest where all films are just called mo- or Disney's in the future. Because Michael Bay, he makes shitty movies, but he makes like theater experience movies, right? They're, they're big movies, right? I mean, I don't know, like, the, the I, again, I don't read the business side of the movie industry enough, so I don't know, like, specifically what the deal with Michael Bay is. Because you got to think, some of these streaming services are specifically going out and trying to get these people. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it may not necessarily be that he tried to get this in the theaters and they couldn't get it in. It could be that, you know, like, they went to him and, like, hey, make a movie for us. I guess. I don't know. So without knowing the, 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 the story, I don't want to comment for sure, but, I mean, I don't know. I, we've talked about this before, like the way movies are consumed is, is changing. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's too fucking expensive to go to a theater. Yeah, but whose fault is that? Not mine. That's right. It's <laughs> Disney's fault. No, it's not. Well, I mean, I mean like uh, Disney's. Um, I mean, they're part of the problem. Partner to a larger overarching yeah. problem of just inflation is out of control and <laughs> wages aren't matching it. And yeah. Uh, and then uh, Disney is sort of directly responsible for it because of their practices on how they require theaters to operate in order to be able to screen their films. I mean, a, a which little prevents bit. Their... But... No, there's absolute... When The Hateful Eight came out, there were certain theaters that couldn't show it because if they were willing to show it over Star Wars, then that theater was not going to get Star Wars at all. Mm-hmm. So Disney said, we'll take Star Wars away. And the theater said, no, we need Star Wars to make money, so now we're not going to show Hateful Eight so we can show Star Wars on eight fucking right. screens. Or so, like, I mean, again, though, <laughs> I don't know. We're, we're, I mean, we're arguing really separate things, I think, but I don't know. Well, I'm just saying, um, yeah, so the large problem is movie, going to movies is expensive, so you're only going to see certain movies in theaters anyways. Disney's uh, just sort of cannibalizing the theater industry anyways. You know, into the, to make it work in their favor, so they're they're accelerating things. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but again, like I don't, I don't know. It's not Disney's responsibility to save the theater industry. Uh, no, but I'm just pointing out that Disney fucking sucks and they're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess everyone already knows that at this point. There's nothing we can do about it. But there's no reason to stop complaining about things that are shitty. So I'll just keep complaining about how shitty Disney is. <laughs> According to cinematographer Dean Semler, the camera rig used to get medium close-ups of Max driving required him and an assistant cameraman to stand on a small platform mounted to the driver's side of the car. They found out during one sequence that they miscalculated the lift because whenever they went up or down a hill, the platform would actually scrape the ground, sending out a shower of sparks. Initially, they were involved, they were al- alarmed, but then they just shrugged and kept shooting with that. Because <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of like, oh, that's kind of scary, but it's not like life-threatening losses oh well i guess let's do it but what was dangerous is when they blew up the oil compounds yeah it looked dangerous (laughs) yes that was for sure they legitimately blew up that set (laughs) yeah so no they for sure blew it up the australian army came in to blow it up um and beforehand they had to notify all the airlines in the area and all the mines in the area had to be closed because the, the shockwave was fucking insane and George Miller recalls, I remember the shockwaves. They were huge. <laughs> and he had, a, he had a glint in his eye. <laughs> you know what, George They Miller, wouldn't let me do it again for Fury Road. They said CG is fine, those dirty bastards. I think we talked about this before on um, uh, Thunderdome, but uh, George Miller, do you know he was an accomplished physician before he became a filmmaker? Uh, no, maybe I did. I don't remember. Yeah, a lot of the stunts where there were accidents and stuff, he was like... Like, oh, let me take a look at that. <laughs> Speaking of stunts gone awry, one of the more spectacular stunts in the film was actually a serious accident. <gasps> oh, no. One of the motorcycle riders hits a car, flies off the bike, smashes his legs against the car, and cartwheels through the air towards the camera, which is fucking awesome. Uh, that was real, though. It wasn't supposed to happen. It was a genuine accident. The stuntman was supposed to just fly over the car without hitting it. Nearly fatal incident. Looks so dramatic. <laughs> yeah. That it's kept in the movie. The stone, the stone in, uh, he just ended up breaking his leg like fucking really bad. But he, hey, was, he was okay. Think about that, guys. We almost so much someone die. I mean, not even close, man. He just exploded his leg all the hell. I mean, he was pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If he flipped like, the other way, he's dead. I, like, how, like, just, ooh, how wonderfully convenient that his body tumbled towards the camera, though. Like, <laughs> ah. Yeah. The, what, a, what a happy little accident. That was like in, um, what was the Robocop? Remember the police chase sequence where the hubcap comes off and oh, flies yeah, in the yeah. camera? And that was just a coincidence. This is the same sort of thing, but with a human life. Makes it ten times more thrilling. 
And then, yeah, the big stun at the end when they're going to roll the tanker. Uh, it was deemed so dangerous that the stunt driver was not allowed to eat any food 12 hours before they shot in the likely event that he'd be rushed into surgery. Oh, my God. That's a brave fucking dude, huh? <laughs> they're like, all right, man, so we're going to do this stunt. You're going to get fucked up. Don't eat anything. Don't eat, because you, you were for sure going into surgery after this. No food, and then no water. He was just like, all right. He was probably like, ah, oh, fair dinkum. <laughs> Because he's Australian, I'm sure. That wasn't part of the... No food? That wasn't part of the deal? That wasn't part of the deal. Wow. That wasn't part of the deal. Bad dinkum. Um, now, let's talk about visual storytelling, if you will. No. I want to go back to Lord Humongous's gang. Um, it's a, I wouldn't even call it a gang. It's more of a some sort of a conglomeration of gangs. If you notice, there's actually like five different gangs based on visual motif that make up his crew. Yes. So there's uh, guys that look like um, the ex-cop sort of gangs that were in the first Mad Max. You know, with like the silver helmets, full leather, yeah, yeah, yeah. visors and shit. There's the Mohawk punks, obviously, which Wes is one of them. There's a few other guys. They there's, typically ride uh, motorcycles, too. Yeah, there's dudes in the buggies that um, are all in furs. And there's even the, the, the fur guy with a bunch of medallions that gets his fingers chopped off by the boomerang. And just as a quick aside, I feel like the dune buggy is probably the best vehicle for the post-apocalypse wasteland that we see. Well, obviously, it's the V8 Interceptor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's uh, the one dude who tries to crash into the compound who's got a pink car. And he's got his hair and his beard dyed pink. And he's wearing all pink. He's in some sort of pink gang. And then, I think um, he's in some sort of rainbow gang. Like, uh, the color gang. Uh, no, I think there's some like uh, like production notes on all these gangs being specific things. And then there's like an all woman gang, um, like you know, all the women you see that are in his gang are all sort of dressed the same. And then there's like another like variation of like a punk gang that doesn't. They're not like the Mohawk guys, but they're wearing like studded shit, but it's like different. So obviously, and this is why I think Wes is kind of like a leader too, because he tells everyone else what to do and shit. Thinking he must have been the leader of like the Mohawk punks, right? Mm-hmm. And then Lord Humongous just... He's like the emperor. He's the king of kings. Yeah, he like... Similar to Morton Joe, right? He just um, was powerful enough to incorporate all these different gangs and have them serve under him. Which is fucking... Ooh, chef kiss. <laughs> <laughs> fucking last filmmaking, man. All you gotta do is just look at the different costume designs for these characters. And you're like, oh, these are different gangs. And Lord Humongous is so powerful, it brings them all together. In fact, he could probably bring this com- compound under his boot heel. Cause he's so buff. <laughs> um, and if you, you compare <laughs> that to, uh, he's a real leather daddy. Say maybe the first order and Star Wars. Oh god, <laughs> what are these bastards all about? <laughs> they're they're. Lo- we kind of want to look like the Empire. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I just wanted to show on Star Wars one more time. But yeah, no fucking George Miller knows how to make a flick. Um, crazy that he was a doctor and he's like, you know what? Time to make crazy action movies. And the witches of witches of Eastwick, witches of Eastwick, uh, a crazy erotic horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh yeah, I guess we should we could talk about exploitation, but it's yeah, just it another <laughs> just another variation of exploitation films that they just happen to be coming from Australia at the time. Mad Max, of course, being like the flagship film, the one that really broke through, and then the Road Warrior, I guess, probably being like the gem in the crown of exploitation films. Fucking awesome. Best movie of all time. <laughs> Maybe Fury Road. Right? I don't know. It depends on which one I watch next. I've watched Fury Road like so many times too. There's no way you watched it more than Road Warrior. We watched no, it so much as kids. Road Warrior was just on all the time when we were kids because we'd rent it all the time. We'd be like, all right, got to put the Road Warrior on so I go to my happy place. <laughs> put the Road Warrior on, do some other shit. It's like, you know, um, you know now like... You're driving to work or you're at work or some shit. And like you're like, oh, I'll just listen to like podcasts, blah, yeah. whatever, just because it's like whatever. It's just, I just need background noise, some shit to do, whatever. That was Road War back in the day. <laughs> Drive to work, put the Road War on. <laughs> Be at work, put the Road War on. Hell yeah. I'm just going to stick my iPhone to the steering column and watch Road War as I drive. Uh, yeah, I mean, I see tons of people out there on the road that are just, like, looking at their phone and shit. So, I guess you could just sit there and watch the Road Warrior. If you had a Tesla, you could, right? I think that's how it works. Watch the Road Warrior, and then it kills pedestrians and explodes. You could be a Road Warrior. Yeah. 
Did you see, um, you know, speaking of Elon Musk, his cool tweet? This is a cool about, recent tweet. The one about building tunnels? That yeah. One? He's like, what? A, what a high capacity tunnels. Fucking oh, Elon Musk. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you mean like fucking subways? subways? <laughs> no, these are will have cars in them, though. Oh. So it's subways so for it's, rich people. Yeah. It's even more useless? Oh. Fucking build trains, man. <laughs> build fast <laughs> trains. What are you doing with your stupid ass techno fascist money? God damn. Tearing down a rainforest. Yeah. Let's, let's, uh, well, they're tearing down the black forest in Germany for the Tesla factory. And then you have these fucking, uh, fucking smelly ass neckbeard Reddit boys that are like, Tesla, Elon Musk and Tesla are going to save the world. They're helping fight climate change. No, they're not, motherfucker. They're tearing down the forest so they can make a luxury item for like fucking fat losers like you. God damn. Cybertruck. This world's trash, but not in 2020, because guess what? 2020, I'm killing Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> Man, he can't have like that good of security. I just can't imagine anyone actually caring about him. <laughs> I bet Grimes would be real, real, real sad. Fuck no. Man, no. I doubt it. <laughs> you don't know. I guess I don't. It's just... I But... It's beyond my imagining. Like I said, I just cannot see anyone caring about this fucking nerd. You gotta expand your horizons. You gotta think outside the box. There's people out there. Uh, do more drugs, then I'll be able to understand Elon Musk. Huh? Nah, that's Elon Musk's problem. His he's problem like, is he didn't start doing drugs until he's 40, and now he's having all the thoughts that everyone else had when they were like 14. Oh, what do we build tunnels underground and put cars in them? Ooh. Uh, I'm just waiting for the tweet where it's like, hey, what if... Uh, the way you see colors isn't the same way that I see colors. I'm pretty sure I did that one. Send tweet. <laughs> Whoa. Fuck, what a fucking visionary. Who has thoughts like these? Uh, Ten-year-olds. I want to do like an art installation where it's just all of his quotes, like all clips of him from the Joe Rogan episode he was in, where he just says all this garbage bullshit. And like if you see it out of context of him just endlessly saying his bullshit, you'd be like, oh, yeah, this guy's a fucking idiot, huh? He's nah, he's a <laughs> fucking Tony Stark of our time. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least Tony Stark was an alcoholic. <laughs> That's relatable. Nothing about Elon Musk is relatable. Garbage. Oh, well, I'm going to try to be more positive in 2020 as soon as I get those drugs in me. <laughs> I feel like lately I've been living in like a Tom Waits song, but I'm trying to mix it up. I'm going to live in like a, I don't know, a weekend song. Which one? I don't, whichever ones are the most about cocaine. You just got to get the right, the right soundtrack, the right feel for 2020. Some rappers got to come out of nowhere talking about doing heroin and stuff. Get that ball rolling. I'm ready. <sighs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year. This is being recorded uh, slightly before the new year. So I'm going to channel across the waves of time to c- confer with my future self on New Year's Day. And I'm I'm guessing I'm feeling that I'm real hungover and not excited about the new year. What do you think? Think that's accurate prediction? I can feel it. I can feel it. It's a little bit too many gin and tonics. <laughs> <laughs> My throat hurts because I smoked a whole pack of cigarettes. And I was like, oh, I thought I was gonna go to the gym today. Fuck. No one fucking goes to the gym on New Year's. I mean, I might if I don't end up actually getting fucked up. Hung over. Getting twisted like he sweat. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the future holds, but I'm looking forward to 2020. I think it'd be bold new year for the VHS cult. It better be. Be out there on the high seas making... Wait, we're going to become like a pirate podcast? I don't know. If can, you change up themes once in a while. Maybe Sequest. 2020 will be pirate-themed VHS cult. Sea Org. Is that the Scientology shit? Yeah, Sea Org was the... Boat let's let's get a boat. It was just full of like fucking dookie, because <laughs> it was like it, they it, didn't wash it. Yeah, but yeah, it was it used to be like transporting cattle, and they're like, oh, I'm L. Ron Hubbard. I'll buy this dookie ship. Come surround me, children. Thanks for joining the Sea Org. Now I need and dry all of my penis. <laughs> Clean up all this dookie. Oh. Laffy. <laughs> <laughs> His name is Lafayette. All right, well, I guess I'll do it. I don't. Do we want to talk about uh, Road Warrior anymore? You got any hot takes about Fury Road? <laughs> I think I did all my Fury Road hot takes. Uh, costume, so good. That's one of my notes. Mm. Remember when Tom Hardy got jacked to play Bane? Oh, 
Oh, that was cool. Remember, uh, remember the Dark Knight Rises? Yeah, it didn't stand the test of time, did it? Did it? It not even really stand the test of time when it came out. I've seen that entire trilogy did not age very well. The last few times I've tried to watch them. Uh, I think I, I watched Batman Begins that long ago. I thought it was old Yeah, um, it's not as bad as like watching like '80s superhero movies where they're like super like dated. Or but, like uh, the X Men movies. Yeah, but I can see it like creeping around. So I was thinking like the new Star Wars trilogy. In like ten years, it's gonna be fucking hella dated. There's so much like very 2010s like style of humor in air quotes, and <laughs> you know what I mean. Like it's like, oh, this is gonna be like corny as fuck in a few years. <laughs> I mean, it's already like bad for me personally, but as taste evolves, I think it's gonna be firmly entrenched in the 2010s. Which is, you know. Can't really say that about the original trilogy. Or even the prequels so much. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe the prequels. Yeah, there's just something about like that pop humor, lowest common denominator, broad storytelling that Disney employs for Star Wars and a little bit in Marvel films mm-hmm. that like some of it's gonna oof it's not gonna age very well. I, it's just you know, Star Wars is such a huge misstep. Whatever. Yeah. I mean there's really been I mean, who the fuck thought they were going to make any more of, like, the original story anyways, right? I don't know. Like, I don't understand why you would do it. I remember Disney bought it, and then it was, like, a month later, like, there's going to be a new trilogy, and it was like, okay, I guess. And then it was fucking back in the forefront of everyone's mind, right? That's when, like, Star Wars was fucking back, baby. Yeah, the Force is awakening. Yeah, but uh, the whole world was also, like, done with Star Wars tried so hard they just couldn't do it i'm thinking it's because deep down inside most people know they were done with star wars (laughs) (laughs) there wasn't really anything to add to the story they really i mean after there wasn't after the the original trilogy the prequel trilogy was pointless we already knew everything we really needed to know about vader right yeah but palpatine is back and he's been here the entire time, apparently, from what I understand. I haven't seen the movie yet. Perhaps you've what already knew about that audience from a Fortnite experience. Cross marketing. Weird. What is this, this whole section is going to be cut from the bottom. <laughs> what like, a weird. rambling at this point. What a weird world we live in. All right. Yeah, that'll do it then. 2020. Um, fuck, 20, fuck 2019. You're dead fuck to Star me. Fuck Star Wars. You're dead to me too. Fuck Star Wars Whatever. 2019. Leave that in this decade. We're going on to a new decade. I know technically 2021 is the start of a new decade. Fuck that shit. That's not how people think. 2020, new decade. I'm talking uh, avant garde pop, experimental electronic music. Good movies are going to be making a comeback. Uh, Marvel movies are going to tank. Eternals is going to make about $5. <laughs> Uh, world's gonna change 2020 VHS cult that's what's up it's all about VHS cult so go to McVenture Productions now get in on the ground floor become our first Patreon first Patreon we get I'll have sex with you <laughs> uh, I don't think you can make that promise why not I mean you can fuck it there it is I just know you keep it I don't know like we'll see how it goes well, I mean we'll see how 2020 goes if I'm on that hurrah man <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what I'll be capable of? What are we watching next? What's the first movie in 2020? It was fucking uh, Road Warrior was, technically. Not really. I mean, it's coming out on January 1st. Yeah, but we didn't watch it in 2020. Oh, I don't know about you, but I watched it in 2020. <laughs> um, oh, we're watching Miller's Crossing next. Oh, uh, we're crossing Miller's? Yeah, we're going to watch my favorite Coen Brothers movie. Pretty close, anyways. The Lady Killers? What the fuck? <laughs> oh, at least it's got Marlon Wayans in it. Lady Killers, I mean. Not Miller's Crossing. <laughs> <laughs> Miller's Crossing. I knew that. <laughs> Miller's Crossing does not have Marlon Wayans in it. All right. For real. Legit. Um, McVentureProductions.com. Be our first. Be my first. Donate to the podcast. We'll have merchandise eventually as soon as we have um, friends. <laughs> and then... Um, Follow us on Twitter. I'm at Kyle Lamaine with two Y's. I'm at A. Sean McDonald. S H A W. M C. A. 
thought it had like a four in it or some shit, didn't it? Oh, I thought it was like SH four. I don't know. There's some leet shit. Remember leet? I remember leet. Yeah. Whatever. Cool, man. Fucking. That's we're bringing it back in. Leet speak. Oh, you want next to? decade? I'll go change my Twitter uh, name to be all leet speak. Yeah, get that ball rolling. All right, uh, rate and review on iTunes or Spotify or some shit. Do something. Get us up there. We need numbers on the board. We need to get a crew going. We need to get a cult going. We need to destroy 2020. Eventually get enough power that we can kill Elon Musk. Who's with me? Huh? 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 All right, VHS cult. I want to buy a swamp. Take a bow.